Hi everyone, it's Will. Welcome to Mini Canron Intro Hangout number eight. Last time we uh, got our first introduction to the Mini Canron core language, and we saw that there are three operators: eq, equal, fresh, and condi. Plus that there, those were the logical operators, and plus there was um, an interface operator between Scheme, which is our host language for this implementation of Mini Canron, and Mini Canron itself. A logical language and that interface operator that we we're using is run and run can either take a number like run five if we want it most five answers back or it can take an asterisk run asterisk with no space between the run and the asterisk and that means give us all the answers back okay so that that was the language we saw uh, i think we'll see a little bit more today we're going to add at least one more constraint there that turns out to be useful and i think today uh, maybe the main focus is still on trying to take scheme definitions, scheme programs, scheme functions, and translating them into Mini Canron, and going through those steps so that you can do that on your own, and you know try try to understand what's going on when we do that conversion and what happens when we run these programs a little bit. And when we get into the implementation of Mini Canron, I think that'll also help, uh, at least with understanding what's happening. I'm not sure understanding the implementation of Minicanon really helps with writing Minicanon programs. We'll also see another way once we get to the relational interpreter of turning a scheme program into a relation. It's a very different way of doing it. Uh, it turns out in some sense it's much easier, but it has trade-offs just like anything else. So, uh, so today we will continue writing scheme definitions in Minicanon or translating them. So let me share my Emacs. Okay. So I have, uh, I've added the code already for uh, the Hangout 8 code. And I'm also uh, you know, starting a new file, hangout8.scm or hangout dash SCM. So I've loaded the files already for faster mini Canon. Um, and as uh, we, we had a little discussion beforehand, I, I should just point out a couple things. So one is if you're you're following along with this book, uh, The Reason Schemer, that I wrote with Dan Friedman and Oleg Kislyakov, uh, if you are following along with that book, you'll notice that there's some definitions that I haven't talked about and that faster mini Canron doesn't, doesn't include uh, by default. Uh, so for example, you know, we did appendo last time, right? So we, we wrote the definition of appendo and actually let me bring up uh, the code from last time. So here's appendo as we wrote it. And you notice that we, for the null check, the equivalent of the null check and append, we are trying to unify the empty list with L. Or uh, when we need to take the car and the cutter of L in effect, what we do is we unify L using equal equal with a single unification. We unify L with a pair constructed using cons uh, of you know, we're counting A to D, where A and D are newly introduced or fresh logic variables, OK? Um, so we're not taking cars and coders. And we talked about last time why we couldn't do that. That's not safe, because you can't take the car of an unassociated or fresh logic variable. Many can run, or sorry, Scheme doesn't know about logic variables, OK? So we're representing logic variables a special way. Turns out, in this implementation, we're representing logic variables, I believe, as vectors. We could represent them one of many other ways, just like we can represent environments and interpreter many ways. <laughs> oh, excuse me. But anyway, for however we represent uh, logic variables, Scheme has no notion of logic variables. It's not you know the notion of logic variables not built into the Scheme language or Scheme implementations. So if we try taking the car of a logic variable, we're going to get some sort of error or some sort of behavior, or even worse, some sort of behavior that doesn't make sense. Uh, if we represent logic variables as certain types of lists, maybe we get the car of that list back, which isn't what we want at all. So we have to be very careful. 
Uh, cons is safe because cons is a constructor. It doesn't actually care what the values are. It's passed. It's just going to package those up in a pair. Okay, so constructors are safe, but destructors like car and cutter, they're going to take apart part of an object. Those generally aren't safe to use with Minikanron because what happens if you give the destructor a logic variable? It's not going to know how to deal with it. Okay. So anyway, uh, if you looked at the actual definition of append and scheme that we started with down here, you could see that uh, in the recursive call, we're taking the car of L and we're taking the coder of L. And we're conning together the car of L with the recursive call, you know, that kind of thing. And this uh, unification, the single unification of the cons of A to D to L is the same as both car of L and the cutter of L together. Okay, this is like, like doing the two operations simultaneously because now A becomes associated with the car of L, D becomes associated with the cutter of L, and furthermore, this works even if L is a fresh variable. Basically, if L comes in as a fresh variable, has no value associated with it, this unification will make L a pair, and the, and the car of pair will be A, and the cutter of pair will be D. And, as, and if we modify the value of A, or if we unify the value of A, I should say, then the, the car of L will be will be uh, updated in that, that same way. So if, if A became unified with 5, then the car of L would become unified with 5. And so, if, so L would be the pair 5 dot some logic variable D, that kind of thing. Okay, so, so we can simulate the behavior of taking the car and taking the cutter simultaneously through this call to equal equal. There's another way we could do this. We could take cars and cutters. And that is to be, I want to say a little more explicit, but there's nothing non explicit about this called equal equal. Rather, we could be a little more schemely, I guess you could say, or, or try try to be a little closer to uh, the, the operators that we're used to, the, car, the cars and the cutters. So just like we have append turns into appendo in Mini Canron, what we could do is we could uh, define let's see we could define our own operators that are instead of car and cutter these are the many canner equivalents so these are car o and cutter o so remember by convention the names in many canron usually end with an o okay so caro could be the equivalent of car, cutero could be the equivalent of cutter, and we could even have a conzo. which is the equivalent of cons. And if you look at the reason schema, you'll see that we have these definitions and that we use them in the book. Uh, and I'm, I'm of two minds about this. In some sense, this is like a nice, gentle introduction if you're familiar with scheme. Um, Another sense, it's uh, it's really not necessary. You don't need these additional operators, so it's more stuff to go into your head, and maybe you think the, the system is more complicated than it needs to be. And anyone who's actually really used to Minicanron, I think, doesn't use these operators at all. Uh, they, they don't, they're not really helpful once you understand what's going on. They're sort of training wheels, and you're going to discard those at some point because it's actually much simpler uh, to write the equal equal version, the unification version, it's, it's more succinct. It's actually more efficient. I mean, not not that we're really worried about efficiency right now, but uh, but anyway, there, there sort of has no disadvantage other than the consos and the caros and cutteros maybe look a little more familiar. Uh, so that's that's why I tend not to use these. But we can talk for a second about what these operators are and how you define those. So so if you remember. You know, we had this fragment of code, and so so let's say we have some list L coming in. So we got some function that takes a list L, and it's going to introduce fresh variables A and D, and we're going to unify A and D with L. 
Okay, so this this is very similar to that fro code fragment we saw. from Appendo, right? So here's here's our fresh AD. We have a lambda containing L, and we're going to unify the cons of AD to L. Okay, so this, this is sort of the gist of what's going on from our Appendo definition, okay? So uh, this the this unification, maybe, maybe we should look at a specific example. So let's say that L is coming in I don't know, let's say L is the list one, two, three, four, okay? Now what's gonna happen is we're gonna unify L, which is list one, two, three, four, with the cons of A and D. So this is equivalent to unifying this list with cons AD. Right, which is going to be a pair. And if you think of it that way, then you know, sort of, sort of the way I, I would might write it, sort of the more advanced mini canony would be like this. So, so we have a pair, and we know about back quote or quasi quote and comma and what those do, um, and we're unifying it to this list, right? And we know what lists are. We know that lists are really pairs. Okay. So this list, one, two, three, four, is really the pair one dot list two, three, four. That's really what the list one, two, three, four is. And now we can see that we can just kind of line these up. So the A part becomes associated with one, right? The car or the car of this list is just one. So A is going to become equal to one through the unification. Whoops. So A is going to be equal to one. And D is going to be equal to the coder, which is the list two, three, four. Okay. Right? So, so we've taken simultaneously both the, the car and the cutter. Uh, okay, so so with that in mind, we could think of what if we want to take this fragment of code and turn this into an explicit definition for like caro, let's say, okay? About is the caro, the car. And so what is what is it gonna look like? Well, car, you know, so the list uh, one, two, three, three, four, five, is going to produce us, or you know, is going to produce one, right? Okay, but Caro is going to behave a little differently because Caro is now going to take like an out argument. No, it's going, to, it's going to now be a relationship between different arguments, and now basically what what's going to happen is is we're going to unify out with the car. If we want to think about running Caro in effectively the forward direction, if you want to think about it in terms of directions. Obviously, we could put a concrete list in the out position or concrete value in the out position. So we could also say something like Caro, you know, one, two, three, four, five to one, and that would succeed. Or we could do the same thing here. Caro, one, two, three, four, five to two, and that would fail because that's inconsistent. Or we could also put, you know, a logic variable L here and saying, hey, we want a pair whose first thing is uh, is two. And so now we get back, you know, pair two dot D, where D is a logic variable. We're going to get that kind of thing back, right? So we can put logic variables in the first position, the second position. We can put it in both, you know, we can do all those sorts of things. All right, so if we're going to define Caro, how would this look? Well, we're going to have our snippet of code. And what it turns out, of course, is that the thing we actually care about, our out argument, is going to be the A. That's, that's the car, right? So we could do our operation and then unify 
out with A. And that would be a definition of Caro. Now, it turns out that this, this can be simplified. Because if you notice, you know, we're unifying A without, and we're introducing this fresh A. But we actually don't need to do that at all. We could just say out is A. And now we could just get rid of the second unification. And now we have a very short definition. In fact, the D, we're ignoring D. So we might even say something like, you know, more like that. This is, this is an argument that we don't care what its value is. Or we could even use an underscore or something like that to say we don't care, match anything. Uh, we have to be a little careful if we're coming from a pattern matching or a prologue background. Underscore means something special, a special syntax. It means like just ignore whatever is there. Uh, in in mini Canron, there is no special designated symbol underscore. So that underscore, that's just a regular variable, variable name. So underscore is getting unified with something. Uh, this is an explicit decision we made for, for reasons that I won't get into right in a second. But anyway, any of these definitions of Caro uh, work. So this is what Caro would look like. And you know, let's let's try Caro just to make sure that our, our tests pass. Is Caro defined? It is not. Not in faster than a canon. I can define it. So let me try uh, the run expression, of course. Okay, out is one. That's right. And I had another one where I. Should succeed. Should fail. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, I was going to uh, make that list L. And turn off. We get a pair whose first thing is two. You know, the car is uh, the pair is two, and the coder is some fresh logic variable. Okay, so all that works. So this is our definition. You know, of Caro. It works just fine. Um, we could do exactly the same thing you know, with Kudero. Kudero just as easily. In this case, it's going to be L to D. And basically, just swap those and make that D. And that's what Kudero is going to be. It's the same idea. So now if I take uh, you know, the Kudero with that, I get the list two, three, four, five back. Okay, so Kudero behaves the way we'd expect, and that also, you know, we can put variables wherever we want just as well. And I guess you know, one one of the things I just wanted to point out though was if we were going to do this, then. If I wanted to simultaneously get the car and the cutter of L, what I now have to do is car of L is A. Cutter of L is D. Oops. Uh, I have to put my L in. Okay. So the first argument is L, and then you can see the, the car of L, and then you can see the cutter of L. Uh, so, so I, I, you know, that's that's fine. It works just fine, but I could do the same exact thing with a single unification. And that gives me the same result. So, I think you'll see that uh, people who are experienced with Mini Canron are much more likely to write it this way instead of doing the separate caros and cuderos. Just write it as a single unification. I also find it easier to read. If I read lots and lots of caros and coteros together, I kind of have to do all the unifications in my head. Whereas here, to get used to the idea of equal equal, or if you're used to pattern matching, this becomes simpler. 
Okay, so there's another operator that you will see also in the reason schema, which is Conzo. Okay, so just like Conzo, five month list six seven and get five six seven. You know, we might want to have a relational version of Conzo. So what would that look like? We're going to cons the A onto the B to get the out. And what does that do? It's just that. There's a single unification. Okay, so that. In other words, Conzo is pretty much pointless. You know, Conzo is just to hide the unification and to to make it consistent with Caro uh, and Kuro. So, so these really are, in a sense, training wheels because they're trying to get trying to get you over the hump of thinking about you know scheme definitions versus many Canary definitions, and it's it's just to try to to make it a little easier for you. But at some point, I think it you know, it becomes less easy. If you get into definitions that are more complicated, then it's harder to look at the Kanzas and the Kuderos in a similar way to the way we use pmatch, right? So when we were trying to get into uh, writing interpreters and that kind of thing, here, here's our eval expert. And with the val expert, we had lines for lambda, let's say, right? So here's here's the lambda line, and and we have this this pattern, which is, you know, it's a list lambda, and then that has a sublist containing a symbol x should be a symbol, and then body. And if we wanted to do more complicated versions of lambda, or here we have let rack, and uh, now the guard is kind of complicated. And you know, if we got into full scheme, we'd have all sorts of quite complicated. Uh, versions of the pattern matching, not super complicated, but but the point is, you don't want to be doing all of this in terms of car and cutter and and equal, you know. Th so so this test would be, if we were doing this explicitly, just using car and cutter and equal would be like, okay, well, first thing you have to see is, is this a list? Is it a proper list? Or you have to start tearing it down a little bit. Is it a pair? Is the car of the pair the symbol lambda? Okay, is the second thing in the pair, you know, is the basically the catter of the list, you know, as, as we go down, actually, it gets more complicated than that because we can't even assume it's a proper list unless we make a list check, which is expensive. You know, so, so it just becomes awkward. You know, we can do it. And in fact, in, in the uh, little schemer, there's an interpreter written using cars and cutters and equals. But it, it becomes really verbose, whereas we can just write this one pattern down and it looks exactly like the code. Right, and so, so uh, it's a similar thing with equal equal. Equal equal is very similar to pattern matching. It's sort of a two way pattern matching, and so once you understand how pattern matching works, if you have any sort of expression that's complicated, it's much easier to just use the pattern matching than it is to break it down in terms of cars and cutters. So that's why I don't use car and cutter row in practice. Uh, it's fine in the little book because the little book's not assuming that you know about pattern matching or that you you really have internalized what equal equal does yet or whatever. Uh, and and for this the examples we're giving, which are relatively small, is fine doing Carl and Caro. But this is why why we don't do it in practice for you know the more complicated code or why uh, uh, you know, faster mini Canron doesn't include Caro and Kuduro and Kanso. It's like, it's not really necessary, but you can see, you can define these very easily, right? These are basically like one-liner definitions. So the reasonable font size that fits on one line of code, right? It's not very interesting. Just each one of these is essentially just a single unification and maybe a single fresh introducing one variable. So that's what Caro, Kuduro, and Kanso are about. And you know, if, you, if you're reading the little book, you can use Caro and Kanzo and Kuduro. 
um, until you become comfortable with equal equal, or you can just go to equal equal and kind of do it the other way. So it's trivial to translate the code from the little book into code using just equal equal. And that's actually a good exercise, good thing, good to get used to. Okay, so that was that was a question about uh, Kanzo, Karo, and Kuro. Another question was about arithmetic, if dealing with numbers, trying to translate things like addition into mini Canran, and that turns out to be trickier than you might think. And we're going to see, well, we'll see why that is, and we'll look at, it, at those operators. But uh, basically, chapters seven and eight of the recent scheme are, are about arithmetic, and it is. Is kind of complicated, and and the reason it's kind of complicated is arithmetic is actually kind of complicated. You know, and there, we were talking about how this, there's this thing called Hilbert's tenth problem, which shows that uh, there is no algorithm that can always find the you know, no general algorithm that can find the solution to any Diophantine equation, which is a type of polynomial that you can express with addition and multiplication. And uh, so, so in other words, we, we basically have an unsightable problem as soon as we have addition and multiplication in our, uh, in our language, we can easily express these, these Diophantine equations and there is no general solution, uh, no general way to solve these solutions. So, or so solve these equations. Uh, so even if something as simple as addition and multiplication in practice and full generality is very complicated and maybe even has undecidability results associated with it. Uh, so don't be, don't be surprised and don't be overwhelmed if something like arithmetic turns out to be much trickier because now we're in this much more general setting than you normally have when you're just programming in, in Scheme or Java or Haskell or whatever, and you're just used to all of the numbers being ground and all these are the sorts of things. You know, not that you can't. Not that you can't express uh, <coughs> Diophantine equations in Scheme, because we are, through mini Canron, we can express those. Um, you could express it more directly in Scheme. But no matter how you express those, direct, directly in mini Canron and directly in Scheme, you know, you're going to run into this undecidability result. So uh, there, there are other issues with arithmetic we'll get into. <laughs> uh, OK. so. Let's take a look with that with that described, you know, Kanzo, Kodoro, Kanzo, and all those definitions, by the way, are in the recent schema if you want to play around with those. You can just type them in, add them to faster mini Cameron. Uh, with that out of the way, let's take a look at our friend member. Let's look at member. Okay. There's also a definition that's in the book. So let's try a new scheme. What does member do? Hmm. So you notice, first of all, member is not a predicate. And so it doesn't take a, a question mark. Um, it might look like it's a predicate because it's returning hash f there. You might think that member of quote a is going to return true, but that's not the, what it does. So what it does actually is it returns the list a, b, c. So it returns basically the rest of the list beginning with the thing you found. Like if we look up b, we get the list b, c. So it's going to return the rest of the list. So we can decide whether or not we want to define our own predicate member question mark, and we could easily do that. We could define our own member predicate, uh, member question mark predicate. Let's just do that in the other buffer. So let's say we want to do this instead of schemes. Remember, we want we want it to be actually a predicate. Okay. Return true or false. We could also do the member behavior like in scheme, but for right now we'll do it this way. So we have some x and some list, some some value and some list. And we're going to try to figure out if x occurs in list. And so this is just kind of our standard thing. Standard recursive definition. If L is null, then no, it doesn't occur. Um, now we have to make a test. So we're going to actually have to have three of these cases. One, one you know, basically, our test is going to be if you know, the car of L x and true. We found it. 
else we're going to recur. Okay. And so this EQV thing, I could also use equal. Or if we restrict this to symbols, we could use EQ. So, so the scheme has different notions of equality. We're always safe in this case to use equal. EQV is sort of similar in spirit. I'll, I'll use equal just to make it simple. Um, anyway, so, so this is a definition of member. And member ha huh, or member question mark, that's going to give us true or false. So let's, let's go back to the REPL, find it. And now we can do member question mark. And instead of getting back a list, we get true. And if we put in something that's not in the list, we get back false. Okay. So let's try translating member question mark into mini Canron and see what that would look like. We're going to do member O, let's say. I guess you could technically do member question mark O, but that doesn't seem very classy. And we're going to have a lambda. We have an L. On becomes con D. And so the first test is to see whether or not L is null. And we could use null O. Okay, in the same way that there's Kanto and Caro and Kodoro, or things we can define. There are Kanzo, Kodoro, and Karo. We could also define Nolo. What is Nolo going to do? It's just going to do a single unification of its argument with the empty list. That's all it does. So just like Kanzo, Kodoro, and Karo, it's trivial. It's just a single unification. So we could use Nolo, and if you want to do that, that's fine. And you know the reason schemer does that. Uh, but we could also just do a single unification of L with the empty list. So it really is the same thing as a nullo call. It doesn't, you know. I think I think nullo to me, this is one of the things about writing a book, right? There, there are all these trade-offs, and uh, nullo in some senses might be conceptually simpler when you're just learning language, but in some sense it's hiding that really this operator equal equal is really powerful and it's used everywhere. And if you look at code containing nullo, Kanzo, Karo, and Kudaro, you might think there's all this stuff going on where all of those are just calls to equal equal. There's nothing special about them. So equal equal is really the important thing to pay attention to. Okay. And we want to return hash f. Well, there's no such thing as returning the value in mini Canron land. Instead, what we would do is we would unify the value with the out. We unify out with hash f. Fine. Uh, let's see, what, what do we do in this case? We want to know if the car of L is equal to X, and if so, return hash T. OK, so we have to take a car. It's like a caro type thing, or equal equal. So we're going to need to be able to get our hands on the car and see if that's equal to X. OK, well, here's one way to do it. We could unify L on the AB. OK, so now. A is the car, and now we can see if the car is equal to x. And if so, it's a little small. If so, we're going to return true. So we're tearing apart L to get the car and the cutter. That's why we need the fresh. We actually don't care about the cutter, but we'll we'll, we'll fix that up in a second. And then we're going to check to see if A and X are the same thing. This is like our call to equal. So we could also have an equal low. But once again, that's just a call to equal equal. We could have a special return O. Once again, that's just a call to equal equal. So you know, equal equal is our giant hammer. And so don't want to hide it, at least I feel. Um, you know, if, if you're just reading the book on your own, you didn't know anything about pattern matching or all the other things we've talked about, then probably Karo, Kanzo, Kudaro is, is, is friendlier. But since we've gone through all this together, and also you have me here to help explain things, and then hopefully it's hopefully we can jump straight, straight to the equal equal version. Okay? Do we actually return anything? Oh, that's a subtle question. Okay. Well, 
We'll see when we get to the implementation that there is something being returned, but we don't see it. It's invisible to us. Um, there is something being returned. It's a stream of answers. But we haven't talked about streams, and we haven't talked about answers yet, really. Uh, so, so that's like an implementation level. So once we dig into how many is actually implemented, then we'll see that there actually is something being returned from, from this Lambda. But uh, it's sort of the user level. As, as someone writing many Canon programs, I don't like to think about the implementation details. I want to think higher level and just say, OK, we have this out argument that sort of represents what used to be returned, and I'm just going to have to unify some value with it every in every clause. Yeah, we talk about returning and we talk about out. So when we're talking about returning, that's in the scheme world. So here's in the scheme world, right? So in scheme world, and here's the mini Canron or relational world. And so here we talk about returning. So here we're in land of car and cutter and returning values. And here we're in the land of equal equal and tons is also allowed. And associating values without. So we, you know, whenever I talk about returning a value, I'm talking about the scheme equivalent. So we're going to return hash t. We're going to return hash f. And as soon as we go to the relational world, mini Canron, we're not returning anything. I mean, under the hood, we are. If you look at the implementation, there's a value being returned, but we're not seeing it. So, so it's not like we're returning, um, you know, hash t or hash f. Instead, we're associating. Through called a equal equal through unification, some value without, and the value itself could be a logic variable. I should really use probably term. Term is more general thing. It includes both terms of more general uh, term of piece of vocabulary. Term includes both concrete values like five and hash t and, and list abc, and also things like fresh logic variables or partially instantiated terms like a list that might contain logic variables and numbers that kind of thing. Okay, so we're going to associate out with some term, which may be a fresh logic variable, maybe a list containing fresh logic variables, maybe concrete values like five or list ABC, whatever it is. Okay, so now we're not returning values, we're associating an argument with out. Okay, that's yeah. You find the out the name out misleading. Uh, it is sort of misleading, right? It's it's this really is um, always going to be hash t or hash f in this particular case. And so out is, once again, sort of a cheat. It's a way of, of thinking about the mini canon relation in terms of the scheme function. And so out really is, a, is kind of a naughty word. You know, so, so when we get to the evaluator, we're evaluating some expression in some environment, and then we could say the third argument is out. But really, the third argument should be called val. It's the value of the expression, right? So it really shouldn't be called out. And so out is kind of misleading here, let's see, what would be a better name for it? We want to know if x occurs in L, and this is more like <laughs> this is more like the flag, or you know, does it occur, or something like that. I don't know how, how to call it. Um, that's the other reason is that you know, naming can be hard. And so I'm not sure what to call it, because when we write member question mark, we don't really have a name for the out. Right? It's just this return value. So this is sort of the return value of out, except now we're being a return value of member question mark, but now we're being explicit about it. So we have to come up with a name. Result. Yeah, we can call it result, but that's all, yeah, you're right. That's also misleading because, because maybe we know what the we maybe we know it should be hash t, and we're trying to actually infer x, right? So maybe x is the result in that case. So I don't have a good name for this. Um, left, uh, you know, appendo, left, right, both. So appendo, you could say uh, ls and then ls, 
that would be a good name for Appendo, maybe. So yeah, so if we go to Appendo, um, let's see. If we want to have a better name for Appendo, we could do something like ls and instead of out, ls or you know, concat. I guess this is the concatenated version or something like that. Like I guess L plus S or L plus S because we can have that identifier in a scheme. You know, we could do something like that instead of out. That maybe would be more appropriate. And you know, when when I do try to define more sophisticated relations, you know, I, I very much try to try to come up with names that aren't out. So if we look at you know inside faster many Cameron, there are these interpreters. Here's an interpreter. And if you look, you know, here's a valo, here's a valo. None of these argument names are out. That here we're, we're associating an expression, an environment, and a value. So this is what we're currently calling out. Uh, let's see, if, do we have anything called out? OK, so here's one where I wasn't sure what to call it. Here, here we're extending an environment in a certain way, and I'm calling it out. That's, that's really the extended environment. That should be like that should be like X in for something. That would probably be friendlier. Um, but once again, this is just a convention. So when you're reading the code, you know about this out convention. But um, that usually tells you that this, you know, if you see out, that's that's a that's probably a pretty good sign that you know, either the person was lazy and didn't want to think about a name or didn't know have a good name, or this is a direct translation from scheme code. You can break conventions. That's right. That's right. All right. So we're going to deoutify. I'm I'm willing to not call anything out, but you have to help me with the names. All right. And we'll see we'll see uh, if you end up going back to out again. <laughs> so you have to give me a name for the out argument. If you give me a name for an out argument that's good. Then I'll I'll change it. Yeah, coming, coming up with, with reasonable names is not so so easy often. Uh, is member. OK. I think that sounds almost like the name of a predicate itself. Um, and it's very long, right? It's very long. Um, compared to like X and L. A long name. We could try it. I go back to B for Boolean. Well, we can, but what if we had a Boolean argument coming in? You know. So, so this is it's a Boolean, but it's something. So the problem is we want to capture some relationship between X and L, right? So okay, so here's one. If we want to be verbose, X and L. How about that? That's really what it's saying, is does x occur in L? This is saying whether or not x occurs in L. It is important, this discussion. You're right. I'm glad, I'm glad you're having it, because uh, you know, the out thing is going to seem mysterious. If, if everything's called out, it's going to seem very mysterious, where it's like, well, this, this argument means something. right? That this is representing some relationship between x and L. So we're saying, does x occur in L? Uh, actually, I'm going to show you another way to define member row in a minute that resolves this naming problem. <laughs> We're going to get rid of that argument entirely. <laughs> but though, well, we can't always do that. We can only do it in certain cases when we have predicates. Anyway, uh, so out is now X and L, I guess. Until unless. Uh, we come up with a better name. And now the last case is an else. Hmm. So else, it turns out, also causes a bit of a problem. Like, what does else actually mean? What does else mean in a cond? It's a little subtle, actually. And what does this equal thing mean? Else means true, but, but within the cond, there's some. OK, so let me ask you this. Do we have a member? And this is also a very important concept. So, so here's our member question mark, right? Here's my question to you. Can I just reorder these clauses 
any way I want and have the function define, you know, behave the same way. Does reordering preserve the behavior in scheme? Yeah, using cond. No, I can't. Why can't I? Why can't I do it? Well, so if, if you said else is true, well, then I can replace else to be hash t, right? Time, OK. Well, OK, so so maybe there's a notion of time, or, or at least may, maybe time, uh, maybe I might not use time, but there's certainly a notion of some things happen before others, right? That we're doing we're doing these things like in a sequential order. We're trying to test in a sequential order, <clears throat> and the last test, the the else test, happens after two other tests, and so those tests we know have already failed before we try the else. So we already have some additional information. Whereas if I can reorder them any way I want, about the other two tests with relationship to the, my current test. So I can't just reorder things in general in terms of member. In fact, you know, let's see what happens if I try this definition of member. OK, in fact, I get an error. Uh, guess through the recursion. Yeah, I guess when I hit the empty list, what's happening is I'm taking this cutter. Yeah, so we first need to check null and all that stuff. So, so we can't just reorder things. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Now, what else? What else could we do though? Say we did want to be able to reorder these con clauses any way we want. Yeah, we we have to check if it's null before we take the cutter. That kind of thing, right? Let's think about. It. Let's see if we can write some tests that would allow us to reorder the kind clauses any way we want. The joint, this joint test, that's right. We want this joint test. So the first test is a null question mark of L. Do we have to change anything on this line? Or is this line OK? That one's OK, that's right. Because obviously, this, this first test can't depend on the other two tests, right? The else test or the equal test. OK, so that the test is OK. So we don't have to. We don't have to change that one at all. That one's done. Now we move on to the next test. Equal car of L x. Now is this test safe to have come first? Like, could I just swap those two lines? Would that be OK? No, why not? Because I can't take the car of the empty list. So I'm being protected or guarded. This clause is, you know, this test is being protected or guarded by the fact that the null test failed when being run before it. So if I want to move this first, I actually have to make that null check again. So what I could do is write a more complicated test. Like that. So what I can do is I could say, I can reason this way. I can say that, OK, in the original version of member, for me to get to this equal test, meant that the first test must have failed. It meant that null of L failed. So I can replace, you know, I can, I can say forget about that first line. I don't need that first line in the cond as long as I check that the null test must, the, the null test fails. If the null test fails and my normal test passes, then I can do the thing I did before. And then this is perfectly safe, OK? So that's the game we're playing is we're trying to build up uh, these disjoint tests so that we can reorder our call our calls any way we want or our, 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 sorry our uh, clauses any way we want okay so that that fixes the second test okay so we fixed the first one you know uh, actually that was, that was like a no op right that, that one didn't, didn't require any fixing no operation required to fix that we fix this version so now we come down to the else version. Uh, but that's just the same as before. Are you talking about this and one? It, uh, well, oh, or are you talking about the null one? OK. 
So now we have this last one. Okay, so the first thing is syntactically, we can't reorder things because else, you know, else doesn't make sense syntactically unless it's in the last in the beginning of the last clause. So we're gonna have to, you know, replace else with hash t. Else is the same as having hash t. That's always true. That test is always true. But now we ask, okay, is this test, uh, you know, are, are we safe? Hash t means it always happens, right? So that means that if we were to reorder it and make it come first, for example, that we always run this line within the con. So we're always going to choose this line, and we're going to ignore the others. So that clearly isn't right. That clearly cannot be right. So instead, we're going to have to fix this test, and we're going to have to you know, include the, the test from before. And we're going to play this game of basically we have to make sure that the other tests fail. We have to make sure the other tests fail. So, so if I really wanted to be pedantic about it, I would say, OK, so the first, you know, let me go back to the um, original ordering here. Or may maybe I should look at this one. OK, now let, me, let me look at the original definition. That's probably what you really understand. OK, so in order for me to reach the third clause, we know that the null test had to fail. So and not null. And secondly, we know the SQL test had to fail. So not of that. Okay. If the first test failed and the second fail test failed, then we can run this. Then, then our hash t. I mean, if we really want to be pedantic about it, we can say and hash t. Right. And so that's our test, but we can optimize it because hash t is always true, so that's that's not really necessary. I'm claiming this is fixed now. So I'm claiming that we can now reorder these clauses any way we want, and we'll get the same behavior for member. It won't make any difference. So do you believe that claim? I can reorder any of them. I can reorder all of them that I want. It's true. OK, well, let's, let's see. So we, we're claiming these are all fixed. So, uh, so first thing, without any reordering, let's just make sure that this went. OK, that worked. Now, let me try reordering this. So, I don't know. I'll make the last clause come first, I guess. I'll just reverse the ordering right now. So I, I just reverse the ordering. So, so the last clause comes first. So the first clause now comes last. OK. So I'm going to find it. OK, it still works. Still works. Still works. OK, so if we are very careful with our tests and we're explicit about our tests, we can write our tests in such a way that we can reorder the con clauses any way we want, and the clause always you know, and, and the con still has the same behavior. OK, so but notice that we had to pay attention to what the tests mean, and we had to be explicit about it. So really, that else, what we learned, is that that else really means that the other tests failed. The else is the same as, you know, this was an else before. We had to replace the else with and not null of L and not equal car of L to X. So else is like a little misleading. It makes it look like it's a simple test, but really it's the negation. It means that the other two tests both failed, right? That's, that's really what else means. So in mini Canron, we have to be careful with this because when we replace con with a con d, we're going to try every single clause independently. So we cannot depend on the other tests having failed in order to protect, you know, or to guard our tests or to uh, guard our clause. Uh, so we need to think in terms of 
this other type of tests that are very explicit. And this is similar to something called a Dijkstra guard. Or extra, 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 oh, can't pronounce the name right now. After Dijkstra. Yeah, so this idea of Dijkstra guard and guard command language and all this stuff. And we're going to be explicit. Um, okay, so what is that? You know, why why did we go down this path? The reason we went down this path is in a member row, we have to think the same thoughts. We have to make sure that our tests are independent. Um, so let, we'll come back to the second one in a minute. But in particular, for, for the last test where we had, um, let's see, do I have a version that has else still? Yeah, here's the else version. So here is our original version of member, and we're translating this into memberO. And with that last clause, that's like translating the else clause. Okay. So we see we're going to make a recursive call and you know all those things, but the tricky part is that you know what this what is this else? How do we translate the else? What does that mean? For the else to be translated, what it really means is that the L, the L is not null, and furthermore, the equal test failed. It means that the, the test wasn't equal. Uh, the, the, the equal test didn't work. So mm, how do you translate that? I'm not sure. So we can just ignore that for right now. Let's just ignore it. We know that this might be a problem, but we're going to ignore it. So we're just going to say, forget it, else is like hash t. Else just means we're just going to try this clause. Okay, So we'll just ignore these issues, and we'll see if we can get away with it. So I know I need to make a call to member row, a recursive call to member row. I'm just translating the recursive line now. I know the first argument is going to be x. Hmm, I need the cutter of l. OK, so if I'm going to need the cutter of l, then I have to play the game we played before. So fresh d. Equal, equal, actually, I'm going to do AD, I guess. Equal, equal L on AD. So I'll give me my car and my cutter. So my cutter is really, cutter of L is really D. So that's my D. But member O is taking three arguments, which is an out. OK. Well, that's actually just um, the actual out. This is, this is a tail call. There's no, no more work to be done. So, so that's what's happening. I need I need to get the cutter of L. And this is, you know, remember, once again, I could have done this with cutter O of L is, uh, is D just as well. Um, and now I make the recursive call. All right, so here is a mini Canron definition of, of member. Let's see what happens when I try this. Make sure this isn't already defined. Well, not the Oh, yeah, I could call. <laughs> there we go. Yep, old habits do die hard. Okay, so let's try uh, number O, run star Q. Naming things is hard. Remembering that you name things is even harder, apparently. OK. Ah, I guess it helps if I load uh, <laughs> if I load many can. OK, so let me go back, because I've, I've got like a zillion things in this file. I think I can load this file. I think it's OK. So let me, real way, because I, I I didn't have many can. But if you get some. Some error, like exception, variable Q is not bound, and that probably means your mini is not loaded. So I killed my scheme, and now I need to load it again. So load my Hangout 8. CM. OK. That also loaded my definition of number. So let's see if that works. Oh, well, that's interesting. 
Is A a member of the list ABC? Yes and no. Huh. Okay. Is A a list, a member of the list, empty list? No, definitely not. Okay, well, that's good at least. Uh, how about is Y a member of the list ABC? Definitely not. Okay, well, all that is good. This first one seems less good. So it's saying that A is both a member of the list ABC and it's not a member of the list ABC. So why is that happening? Why are we getting both answers back? Superposition, yes. This is like we're now in the quantum world, right? Uh, we're getting the empty list in terms of what? Do you mean like representing failure or? Uh, I well, maybe I'm not under, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by the getting the empty list, and that might be part of it. But you you're gonna have to tell me whether it is. Uh, there's another cause. Okay, let me put it this way. There's a reason we just had this a little aside about guarded, you know, clauses or Dijkstra guards or trying to make sure we understood what else really means. You know, we went through all that discussion, and now, you know, when, when it came time to translate the else, I just got rid of it, right? And so that's the problem. The problem is because we're in con D world, each one of these clauses is tried independently. And we'd better make sure that the the tests in the, the scheme version of member are 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 uh, are respected in the mini canron code, or we'll get duplicate answers back that we shouldn't get before, or we shouldn't otherwise get. Okay, so uh, so we have th uh, three tests, three guards uh, for our con clauses. The first one, null test. Let's make sure that we're actually respecting that in our minute camera code. So here's a, the equivalent minute camera code, and we're checking to see if L is the empty list through unification. So if L is not the empty list or doesn't unify with the empty list, then this clause will fail and not produce an answer. So this, this test, the null test, we're respecting. So that's OK. All right, let's look at the second clause. We have uh, this test in the scheme version. So we have to check to see that L is not null. Another way to think about this is that L has to be a pair in our particular, because we know that basically L is going to be a list. We could also have a pair test there instead of not null, but we're trying to be you know, pedantic, so it's not null, because you know it could be a number as well. Whatever. Uh, you can't take a car of a number as well. but. We're 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 making some assumptions here that by just wrapping not not around the test we we're always safe. But we want to say L is not null and and uh, the car of L is equal to x. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. Um. So this is here we're taking the car and and the coder of L. So remember that the car of L is equal to a. Okay, the car of L is equal to a. So we're checking to see if A is X. So this is like, is the car of L equal to X? That's the same as this test right here. So, so we are doing that. Uh, we're not checking about the null test, though. We're not explicitly checking to see if L is, well, are we or are we not? So here's the interesting thing. Is this use of equal equal that allows us to get around this 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 check for null, because imagine if L is a is the empty list in scheme. If you try taking the car of the empty list, you get an error. But in mini Canron, if you do a unification, you're not going to get an error. If you unify the empty list with the pair you get from consing A to D, the unification just fails, and then this this clause doesn't contribute an answer. So it's safe to do the equivalent of taking the car of L through a unification, the sequel equal, um, even if L is not a pair. So it's actually safer in this sense. We don't have to do this explicit test with the not null. So that's that's not required because we're in mini Cameron land. So so that that test isn't necessary. This, by the way, is another reason why I'm not a huge fan of the the Conzo Caro stuff. And you know, because really 
if we were translating this to be closer to scheme, we would have you know, a not nullo or something like that before we took the con of the caro. But it's not necessary because the way equal equal works. So this call to equal equal really is is both taking the car of L and it will fail you know, gracefully if L happens to be null. So, so basically, we're doing all that work. And then this unification of A to X, that's the same as doing this equal check. So actually, that's, that line is just fine. OK? It's just fine. Um, OK, well, what about the third clause? The third clause, we have this test saying that L is not null. And we're going to take the car of L and check to see if that's equal to X. And it better not be the case. Well, we already talked about how we don't have to check to see that L is not null anymore as long as we're taking the equivalent of a cons or a caro or a quidro, and we are. So here, if L were null, then this, this unification would fail because we're unifying L with a pair. And the empty list does not unify with a pair. So, so we've basically discharged our obligation of checking to see if L is not null. So that's the equivalent. You know, this, this equal equal will, will do that test for us. What about this other test? We have to make sure that the car of L, which is A, remember the car of L equals A. We have to make sure that A is not equal to X before we make this recursive call. Huh. We have to make sure that the car of L is not equal to X. Ooh. So, and that better be not equal to x. Well, that we're not doing. We're not talking about that at all. So here, we're checking to make sure that a is equal to x. Well, what we really need is the ability to say something like a is not equal to x or something like that. That's really what we need to do to make sure that we're not going down this recursion when we shouldn't. That's really what that test is saying. So is there a way to say that in many Kenrin? Not with what you've seen so far. With what I've shown you so far in Mini Cameron, there isn't a way to do that. Not really. Unless you play some sorts of bizarro encoding tricks for the, the values and so forth. Um, but if you want to just keep it simple and use lists of symbols or whatever, then you're out of luck. So we've added an additional operator or constraint called a disequality constraint. And in many Canron, it's written equal slash equal. I think in, in core logic, it's like, I think it's written like that in core logic, if I remember correctly, bang equal. Uh, but we write it equal slash equal. So, so it's sort of like a unification with a, a slash written through it to say, hey, no, these things um, are, are, are different. Uh, so the disquality constraint uh, will make sure that A and X are actually different from each other or could be different from each other. And then it should be safe for us to do a recursion. Okay, so let's let's try it this way. Let's see if this works. Look my scheme. Definition. OK, so where were we getting? We were getting multiple definitions for this one, multiple values back from this one. Okay, let's see if that. And now we get a true, but no more falses, is what we'd want. Uh, what about B in behavior? What about Y, which doesn't occur in the list? Nope, definitely not. Um, and for empty lists, A, definitely not. OK, so now we've recaptured the behavior we want through adding this new type of constraint, a disqualify constraint, saying A and X are not the same. They're different. Uh, so this means the unification of X with A has to fail? That's a good question. It does not mean that. It does not mean that. It's a little more subtle. Uh, and in fact, disequality constraints are something where, where people often get a little confused on how exactly disequality constraints work. So let me, let me talk about that for a minute and give some examples. Let's just do some disqualify constraint examples. OK, so we know about equal equal, right? So we can unify 5 and 5, for example, and that succeeds. 
and we can unify five and six, and that fails. And we can unify five with the variable Q, and that succeeds and associates Q with five. Okay, so those are just a few basics. So let's try doing similar things with this quality constraints. So we can say five and five have to be different. Well, we violated that because five and five are actually the same, so it fails. That's why we get back empty list. Okay, so five and five are different. Five and six, are those different? Yes. Okay, so that should succeed because they're different. And it succeeds, sure enough. What about five and Q? Now we get back a more interesting answer. So we get back a special answer that has a side condition. We haven't really seen these side conditions before. So this is a single answer. The answer is sort of like in, in um, you know, before we got back a list containing underscore zero, that was a single answer. Saying, hey, Q, the query variable, could be anything. Here it's saying, single answer, Q or query variable could be anything provided we respect the side condition that Q not be equal to five. Okay. Q not be equal to five. Yeah, the non-unification the non has to succeed. Okay, so where does this become different? Well, okay, so we could also do something a little more complicated. What if we had an X, X and Y as our query variables, right? Mm -hmm. Now I can say X and Y have to be different. So I can try unifying them first. What does that mean if I unify X and Y? Well, it means that the answer I get back says that X and Y have to be the same. That's why we see the same numbers, underscore zero, underscore zero. Because remember, if I did something like five and five, now the numbers are different. So X can be anything, Y can be anything. They don't have to be the same thing. X and Y up here, when we unify X and Y, they have to have the same value. And so, you know, in particular, if I unify y with 5, they both become 5. x and y both become 5. Whereas if I don't have the unification of x to y, y is 5 in this case, but x could be anything. All right, so let's think about what happens when I do the equivalent with this quality constraint. So now we're saying x and y have to be different. But we haven't said anything about what x is or what y is. So when we get the answer back, so let me just show you once again what it looks like when I've said they're equal. Okay. So X and Y have the same thing. Here I'm saying they're, they have to be different. So what is my answer? This, this once again is one answer. We have a list of answers. This is one answer. Let me pull that out. So that's the single answer. The first part of the answer is basically what we would get back if we didn't have a, a side condition. Okay. So this is kind of the answer part right here which is the list underscore zero underscore one, what's telling us what the values of X and Y are. And then the second part of the answer is like the, the side condition answer, I'll call it, okay? So this is like the answer part, and this is the side condition. So for the answer to hold or to interpret the answer correctly, you also have to respect the side condition or keep the side condition in mind. Here, the side condition is a disequality constraint side condition. We can have other types of side conditions, we'll see. Uh, but here, what we're saying is, and this, once again, is a list of, of values. Uh, we're saying that the first variable and the second variable have to be different. So to make it a little easier to read, we can think about you know, this in terms of x's and y's. Right? So, this underscore zero is really x, right? This, the variable x, and this is really y. So let's think about this in terms of variables, uh, just to make it a little more concrete. I'll, I'll make them look like this, to so make them look like not symbols. Okay, so we have a variable x and we have variable y. So when we say, you know, give us all the answers back, this query or, or a query variables x and y where x is not equal to y, we get back an answer saying, okay, x can be anything, y can be anything, provided x and y are not the same thing. Okay, that's basically what the answer is saying. Let's try violating this constraint. So let's say x is equal to 5. So now what happens? Well, now we're saying, okay, x is 5 and y is anything, provided that the anything is not, not equal to 5. Okay, so we've, our side condition has changed a little bit because we know information about x. And now what happens, on one, uh, different lines, 
Now what happens if we unify y with 5? Okay, so now we violated our constraint, our disquality constraint. Because the disquality constraint is saying x and y can be anything, but x had better not ever be the same thing as y. Now we violate the constraint. And now it fails. And of course, as usual, we can reorder these any way we want. The disquality constraint could come last instead of first. It doesn't matter, it could come in the middle. We always have the same behavior. Uh, so, so really what the disquality constraint is saying is that x and y can never be made to be the same. And if they're always, if they're made to be the same, then you fail. Uh, however, if there's any possible way to make them different, then succeed. So when we get rid of the equal equal y five, if we think about it this way, this simple version, um, well, could y be five? Well, it, it can be anything other than five is what it's saying. Could have any value other than five, and then I'll succeed. So we can make x six, I mean y six, and that's fine. It succeeds, right? And it throws away the constraint because there's no way to violate the constraint. They're different. Um, we can make a, a y the list ABC. We can make y the list 5. That's fine. And it, you know, that's fine. Uh, we could also violate the constraint, by the way, by trying to make x and y the same by unifying it. So here, here we're saying they have to be different. Here we are saying they have to be the same. That's inconsistent. Reorder them, still inconsistent. So it only fails if there's no way to make them different. Exactly. If there's no way to make them different, then it fails. Otherwise, it'll succeed. Okay. So it's different than saying that they don't unify. It's different from saying that they don't unify. It has nothing to do with them unifying. I mean, it, actually, there is a relationship, but it, the relationship's more subtle than that. Okay. Okay. So um, let's look at another example. More more interesting examples are when you have lists containing variables. That, then it gets more interesting. Uh, so how about like X, Y, Z or something? So Or X, Y, Z, W or something like that. Um, so here we can say, I'll do W, X. So here I'm saying these two lists have to be the same. Fine. And you can see W is associated with Y and X is associated with Z through the numbering. Uh, but now let, me, now let me make them have a disqualified constraint. Now I'm saying they're different. So now the first thing you'll notice is uh, unlike before where where w and y had the same value, now w, x, y, and z can all have different values. It doesn't matter. But we have the side condition saying that w, the list, w, uh, uh, let me make sure I'm reading that right. Oh, 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 I see. It simplified it to two different disequality constraints. OK. Um, so what it's saying is w cannot have the value of y, while at the same time, uh, x has the value of z. That's what it's doing. So you can actually represent these disequality constraints different ways. That's how it's representing it. So it says that w and y can be the same, but if W and Y are the same, X and Z can't be the same. Or vice versa, X and Z can be the same, but if they're the same, W and Y have to be different. There has to be some way to make those two lists different. So let's try to violate a little bit. So let's say, let's make W and Y the same. Those are the same value. And now our disquality constraint has been simplified. And, and you can see that W and Y are the same because they have zeros. But now you can see uh, x and z's, even though they can be anything, they cannot be equal to each other. Um, and we can make it that a little easier to read, maybe, by making w5. So here, here's w, here's y, they're the same. And you know, x and z 
They have to be different. They can be anything, but they have to be different. So now let me make uh, x something. Let me make x6. Okay, so this is x, and this is z. Z is this. And now we're saying that, OK, x, and, so z can be anything. Z can be anything. That's what it's saying, other than 6. It can be anything other than 6. So it turns it into an or. Um, yeah, you can look at it as a as a representation of an or. You know, either it, it depends on the exact wording you use. But basically, if we go back to to this the, the original, we're saying that either w and y are different, or x and z are different, or they're both different. That's fine. Okay, uh, but. Or another way to say it is, if if w and y are the same, then x and z must be different. If x and z are the same, then w and y must be different. So you could do it in sort of like an implication fashion. There, there are different ways to, to express the same thought. Whichever way makes it easiest for you to think about it is fine. Here, I could say z is 6. Now I violated the constraint, and now it fails. Okay. So basically, you can imagine. You know, Mini Canada is trying to squirm out of making these two lists the same. And if there's any way to squirm out of it, it'll squirm out of it and say, okay, fine, there's an answer, provided you respect the side condition. But if you force these lists to be exactly the same, then Mini Canada is going to have to say, oh, sorry, no way to, to make them different. You fail. There is no answer. And so why, why is this thing useful? Why is this disequality constraint thing useful? Well, it's useful because sometimes you want to express the notion, like in lexical scope, right, when we have an interpreter, um, we have in lexical scope things like this, right? Let x be 5 and, you know, uh, how, about, how about I'll write this? Let uh, y be 6, and now we're going to add uh, x to y. Okay, So we know what that does. We know about lexical scope. We know this will give us 11, right? OK, and now let me ask you a question. Can we rename w, or sorry, rename y? Can we rename y to another variable name? Well, sure, we can rename it to z, let's say. As long as we do it consistently, then it's fine. Now, can we rename z to x? Oh. Even if we rename x consistently, it now doesn't work. We get a different answer back, OK? Because now we've shadowed the outer x. So there's something special about x. x is a special name. And in fact, there's another name we shouldn't shadow. We shouldn't shadow plus. If we shadow plus, we get weird behavior. Because plus is no not longer a function. Now it's, now it's a number. We're trying to call a number as a procedure. So we have to respect some certain names that are you know, plus and, and x within the scope of this uh, inner let. So we better not shadow those, or we're in trouble, which means that uh, we care. You know, we, we can rename z to be anything except for x and except for plus in this particular example. Okay, So if we think about our variable name, you know, so we have some variable x, or well, some variable. Say, so, say so we have a logic variable called var that we're reasoning about, uh, or that's the new name we want to pick. The new name can be anything. New var, new var name. That's our logic variable, right? And so we have like you know fresh, or maybe we have some yeah, fresh new var, new var name, and we want to you know, do some manipulations to pick a new name. Well, we have some restrictions, though. The new var name had better not be x, and it had never had better never be let. Or, I'm sorry, plus. Let, in this case, doesn't matter. OK, so, so in other words, there are some very concrete restri restrictions on just a small number of, of names or identifiers or values that we really care about. Another example would be, if you were doing division, right? Dividing by zero is undefined. So if we were doing some sort of division problem, then 
you know, maybe we have the denominator. Denominator. Uh, and the denominator had better not be equal to zero. Right? So that's another type of disequality constraint. So, so often you have these side conditions that come up when you're doing reasoning or manipulations of, of, of programs or expressions where it's like, this thing can be anything except for this one value or these, this handful of values or values in a list of values that we, we've been accumulating that we know are bad, that kind of thing. Uh, and so the disequality constraints allow us to express those sorts of conditions, and that's why it's useful. Um, and in particular, in the code we're writing for Memberow, we have this one special value. We're saying that, okay, uh, x, what we're asking Memberow, does x occur in L? Well, when uh, we do the recursion, to see if x occurs in the rest of the list, the, the cutter of the list, the d, we'd better make sure that x is not uh, the first thing in the list because that's already being handled. And you know, in this case, we're checking to see if the first thing in the list is is a. In this case, The first thing in the list isn't A, okay? That's that's the assumption. That's what that's what you get with the scheme code. We're saying the first thing in the list is not equal to X. Right? That's what that test is about. Uh, so here, the first thing in, in the list is equal to, to X, and the first and here, the first thing in the list is not equal to X. So we have to be able to express that. And without the disequality constraint, we don't have any way of expressing this this notion. That, uh, that the car of, of L is not equal to X. So that's why we need it. And that's why we get rid of that duplicate extraneous incorrect answer when we add the disquality constraint. Okay, so the, this notion of a disquality constraint is very important for us to, to be able to, to express these sorts of problems and to do things like translate scheme code into mini Canon code in a way that makes sense and preserves the behavior. Uh, so every once in a while, we'll have to have to use a disquality constraint. So, um, and and I, I also point out that disquality constraint is a very weak constraint. A dis disquality constraint is not the same as having not in the language. Like in Scheme, we have not. So we can do not null, not equal, that kind of thing. Uh, not is a very powerful operator. I can negate an entire predicate or entire extremely ex uh, complicated expression. The only thing disquality constraints can say are two values or two terms that might contain logic variables are not the same. It's much, much weaker than doing a not on a predicate or a not on a function call or a not on arbitrary expression. It's a very, very weak notion of negation. Very weak. Uh, and that's why it's useful, actually, is because it's so weak, it turns out. Because if it's if it were a really complicated, really sophisticated notion of negation, then we could get into trouble with the citability or the complexity of the operator and that kind of thing. Equal slash equal will search until exhausted. Nope, it doesn't do any search at all. That's why it's so nice. It's so simple. It doesn't do any search at all ever. It doesn't do any search. Mini Cameron does search, but many but uh, this particular so unification never does search and disqualify constraint never does search. That's why it's so beautiful. If we made it more powerful, then it might have to do search. But we kept it weak, so it doesn't have to do search. It can always decide very quickly whether or not two terms are equal or not equal. And then it basically will keep around that side condition information. Remember, we were looking at these side conditions. So if we do a disquality constraint, and we have the side condition around, what ends up happening is a disquality constraint will partially solve this disquality. And then it will also keep around any side condition information. And that information kept getting, kept, will, will be passed around through mini Canron to see if it ever becomes violated. And if so, then you fail. But if not, you know, so mini Canron will do a search behind the scenes. Uh, but by just 
passing along the constraint information, these side conditions, and, and, and simplifying the side conditions as we go, uh, we can tell whether or not we're going to succeed or fail at any given time. And then maybe we have to do other things in the search. But, but the point is that particular operator, this quality constraint, doesn't by itself do any search. And if Cameron has a search, but neither disqualify constraints nor equal equal do any search. In fact, none of our constraint operators um, that we are going to see for the interpreter, for the basic interpreter, do any search at all. When you get into finding domain constraints to do arithmetic, then it's a little, those constraints are a little more subtle. And there, there's sometimes a little bit of a search that has to go on behind the scenes just to prove that there, an answer does exist. But in general, none of our constraint operators do search. Which is, you know, it's a little subtle. So there is a search in Minikandran. Minikandran's searching for answers, but the search is because, I mean, the reason we have this big search is because our relations can be recursive like this, right? And we can be making choices. So this, the, the search is at the level of the, the choices among Condi clauses, if you want to think of it that way. Condi is what causes the search to branch out. But the individual constraint operators don't cause the search to, to branch out in any way until you get into arithmetic or that kind of thing. Uh, there's certain arithmetic things. Uh, it'll just pick the next, next best value. No, it doesn't, it doesn't like randomly pick a value. If you're talking about like disqualifying constraints or equal, equal um, it picks a representation of all possible values that can be satisfied that uh, that subtract so that you can maybe represent infinitely. Okay, so here's an example. This is why you have to be really careful when you pick your constraints. Also, let's let's just look at one example here where we have x and y. I'm going to unify x and y. So we get a single answer back. I'm saying x and y have to be the same value, is what I'm really saying. Okay, and I get a single answer back, and you can tell from that answer from the numbers that x and y have to be the same value. Now let's think about it. I could be explicit about it, or many Cameron could be explicit about it. What it could say is that, hey. X and Y have to be the same thing. Well, guess what? Zero and zero are the same thing, which is true. Those are the same. And one and one are the same thing. And two and two are the same thing. And it could enumerate all the infinitely many integers that are the same. And it could also say the hash T and hash T are the same. And it could also start doing lists. It could say the list ABC and the list ABC are the same, right? So there are infinitely many values in, in our subset of scheme that we handle in Minicameron with unification that are the same. And, and you could imagine doing a search that enumerated all the infinitely many one of those. But we don't want to do that. We want to avoid that if at all possible. Now, it's not a silly question. It's a very important question. The whole point of what we're doing is, and, and the reason disequality constraint is important, is to avoid, uh, avoid doing search. It's actually the opposite. It, it allows you to avoid doing search. So for example, mm -hmm. Um, so what's the best way to do it? What's the best way to show this? <sighs> okay, okay, so here's an example. Say you didn't have this equality constraints, right? And, um, and I wanted to say, okay, so right now I can say that Q, you know, is not the list uh, A, B, C, all right? So now I just get back this one constraint, one constraint answer saying, you know, Q could be anything as long as it's not the list A, B, C. How would I express that notion in just regular mini Cameron? A Q can have any value other than be the list A, B, C. The only possible way I could do it, so say I even just restricted the value to list. I know Q is a list. And Q cannot be ABC, OK? The only way I could do it is to enumerate every single possible list other than list ABC. So I would have to try unifying Q to the empty list and all the li lists of length 1 and all the lists of length 2 and all the lists of length 3 except for list ABC and then all the lists of length 4 or greater, that kind of thing. 
I would, I would have to enumerate infinitely many lists to express the same notion that, hey, I have a list that's not the list ABC. So it was actually when you don't have disequality constraints that you have to do search to express certain notions. So it turns out over and over again that having disequality constraints allows us to avoid either having a search uh, that produces infinitely many values, or at least a large finite, potentially large finite number of values, or we have to play all sorts of representation games with tagging and untagging and, and, and be very clever at the representation level. And often the code gets messy and it's hard to read. So disquality constraints actually of, allow us to say of all the infinitely many values that we're talking about, or potentially large finite number of values we're talking about, this particular value doesn't hold. So we don't have to enumerate all the values. So, so it allows us to avoid a search. So it's, it's a little bit subtle, OK? I mean, it's a, quite a bit subtle, actually. And uh, we'll, we'll see other examples of it. But you know, we didn't have uh, this quality constraints for a long time in Minicameron. And it made it really hard to, to express things, like this, uh, this member row. You know, there's a version of Membro in the Reason Schemer called Surprizo, and it's a surprise because you get these answers, extra answers you didn't care about, or didn't expect, or shouldn't get. And so that's the surprise, but it's a bad surprise because we don't really show you how to fix it. The way to fix it is it has things like disquality constraints, uh, but we don't know how to explain those in the book. That they're too complicated. So maybe maybe we'll have another book we explain them in. But right now, it's so complicated to explain how to implement disqualic constraints. The, the idea of disqualic constraints, I don't think are particularly hard, but to explain how to implement them, it's more complicated. The, you just need more mechanism than we have in the simple implementation of Minicameron in the book. It's not incredibly complicated, but it's more complicated to add all the infrastructure you need to, to support those constraints. So that's why we've left it out of the book. And, and we've gone back and forth on this decision many times. but. But anyway, disquality constraints are your friend, and you'll find that there are lots of uses for them. And we'll see a couple other constraints that come up that are similar to disquality constraints. Uh, and, and we'll see them a few times, and then eventually I think you'll kind of get the hang of them. But they take a little, a little getting used to. But basically, it tells you, it allows you to express that a particular value, we're not going to allow that particular value. That's it. And in this case, you know, we know what the car is, then a car of L. And we know what x is, and we want to say those two values are not the same. That's it. So it's a very limited notion of, of negation or two things being different that we're going to express. OK, so now we have a working version of Membro. And you know, because we're in Condi land, swap our clauses any way we want. And so here I am. I'm reversing the clauses. Oh, the Emacs crash again. Come on, Emacs, you can do it. Why not? All right. So let me start my Emacs again. This, these are these are good questions, and um, you know, disqualifying constraint. Uh, I reinvented the notion of disqualifying constraint. Uh, so someone on my committee said, well, I reinvented the notion that the sun rises in the east. <laughs> you know, it's like, OK. <laughs> point, point well taken. Um, but anyway, I did come up with it sort of on my own out of desperation, trying to solve some of these problems. And it turns out, of course, that, that people had known about this a long time. In fact, you know, some of the earliest versions of Prolog, if not the earliest version of Prolog, had this. And since then, we, we've introduced some other constraints that, as far as I can tell, there's one constraint in particular we have called Absento that, as far as I tell, no one else has in their system. And that turns out to be important and useful for a particular problem we have when writing relational interpreters uh, that we'll, we'll see at some point. Um, but we also have some type level constraints. We have fine domain constraints that go off of uh, other people. So you know, most of these ideas are, are, are old. We, we're kind of remixing them in a somewhat different way. And even the absento constraints, which are maybe uh, we may be the only ones who have those, even those I ripped off of a type of constraint from something called nominal logic. Uh, 
you know, this happens to work a little bit different, differently. Uh, for sp strictly speaking, we don't need disqualify constraints for many canon, right? Right. So uh, you don't need disqualify constraints, and you know, even without disqualify constraints. Mini canon is Turing complete. You can express Turing complete uh, Turing machines or lambda calculus. You know, so you can do all of these things, um, but it's sort of in the same way. Like an analogy I might make is, you know, we've seen how to implement the call by value lambda calculus, and that's Turing complete. However, even though you could encode numbers and arithmetic as lambda terms, and people do that, and you know. Theoretically, you can do all those things. Uh, in practice, it's extremely awkward, and it's also very slow. If you want to do, you know, floating point arithmetic, and all you have are lambda terms representing numbers, you know, it's like you're you're probably you're gonna have trouble rendering, you know, your 3D first-person shooter game or something like that, right? It's just like, and it's gonna be really awkward to write. So. Uh, I guess what I'd say is that core mini Canron is a little bit like that in the sense that you have, uh, you know, you, you have the ability to express anything you want, but it could be really awkward or it could be really expensive to express things if you don't have additional constraints. Um, yeah, so you know, same with the interpreter, but if if we want to have an interpreter where we don't have to do a lot of tagging on the interpreter, that you know, just like we had tagged lists for environments, this one representation, you can do special tagging in the interpreter to try to avoid disequality constraint, the need for disequality constraints. In fact, Nada Amin has done this, where she she has an interpreter that doesn't use disequality constraints at all, or absento, or any of these other constraints. Um, and she she got around it by playing these tagging games, okay, um, and and so that's that's really cool to see, and it's, a, it's an important reminder that you don't really need disqualify constraints. At the same time, uh, the the interpreter I think is is quite difficult to read, and it's difficult to to understand the answers more more difficult than with the interpreters we're going to write. And furthermore, you have to go through a translation step now. The answers to the scheme code that you might want to run in the REPL to test your program out, and and furthermore, the translation may not always be so simple because if you're translating terms that have partial, you know, that contain logic variables, then translating that into a concrete scheme value isn't always clear how to do it. So the translation could also be kind of tricky. So anyway. Uh, we absolutely don't need disqualify constraints. The entire reason schema doesn't have disqualify constraints. Um, all of Oleg's examples on the original Canron website, he has all sorts of really interesting examples for type inferencers and things like that. None of that uses disqualify constraints. You know, so you can do all sorts of things with this without disqualify constraints or any of the other things. Um, however, I find it useful in practice to have disqualify constraints. It, it gives you nice expressive power. You can you can do everything otherwise, but you're kind of in a Turing tar pit where you know you can express anything, but but nothing of interest may be easy. I mean, this is what Alan Pearl has said in one of his epigrams of programming. Beware of the Turing carpet, where everything is possible, but nothing of interest is easy. Sometimes in Mini Canron, without disqualify constraints and other constraints like that, if I'm trying to write an interpreter or a type inferencer, I kind of feel like I'm in the Turing carpet. I can always do it through tagging. You know, tagging is kind of how you get away with away from these things. But the the first version of the Quine's generating interpreter that I implemented for the people. Closure conj uh, was so complicated through the tagging that no one actually could understand that it, <laughs> that it was a quine. Like I had to try to explain to them, and and I also I couldn't even tell if my interpreter had errors in it because it was so complicated. So, so anyway, disqualify constraints let you write things uh, more simply and more more efficiently. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Okay. Didn't take my allergy medicine today. Um, all right, so now we have Membro. <laughs> uh, now we have Membro. Let me show you another way of defining Membro, because this is actually probably how we wouldn't define Membro. And this is actually a, a subject of debate, just like whether or not to use disqualify constraint as a subject of debate. Oleg is not a huge fan of disqualify constraints that I am. 
or at least he wasn't. Maybe he's changed his mind. Uh, so we had these debates. Uh, okay, here's another debate that we've had on and off is how to write something like Membro. So Membro is similar to a scheme predicate, right? So the idea is to emulate a scheme predicate. And so just to make sure that we actually do get kind of the interesting relational behavior we want, let's try, <sighs> let's just try a couple more tests with Membro. Okay, so now I can say that x is in list, and now I can infer x, right? And so now I get three values back. And of course, those are the things in the list, which makes sense. Uh, or I could say I want y to be in the list. Now, I better not do a run star. But here's one answer. So here's a list that contains y. It's there's a list, there's a pair y dot anything. Have to be a proper list. So then you have to be a, yeah, could, there's any pair that begins with y. Here's the second answer. Second answer is interesting. So here we're saying, here we have, you know, uh, possibly the improper list. And it begins with some, some value, and we don't know what that is. But we have a side condition saying that's not y. So this is where disqualifying constraints come in. So we're saying we have something that's not y followed by y followed by anything. Okay. And we could do you know 10 of these and it's just going to show us more answers like that. So here's, you know. We can see that we're just going to get more and more different values, all of which have the side condition that they're not y. So, we, so sure enough, we have a, a relation. We can start playing these games by, by putting in the, the third argument being, being ground. We can go the other way. We can say, you know, uh, give us some lists that don't contain y. <laughs> okay, so here are three. Uh, whoops, here are three lists that do not contain y. And the first is the empty list doesn't contain y, of course. Here's a list of one element where that one element isn't y. Here's a list of two elements potentially different where those elements aren't y. Okay, so we can we can play these games. Now they may not be particularly interesting in the case of Membro, but we can play these games where we say, you know, we want that x to be in a, uh, in the list L, or, or so it's hash t would, uh, if, if x and L is hash t, then we're saying x should appear in L. And if x and L is hash f, then x should not appear in, with an L, right? OK, so that's one way we could write member O. But another way we could write member O is to, instead of explicitly talking about whether or not x occurs in L, we could use success and failure instead as a sort of a proxy. So if a call to member O succeeds, then X is an L. And if a call to member O fails, then X is definitely not an L. And I'll show you how we might define that version. I'll do it from scratch. <clears throat> So here's our member again. Now, unlike last time, I'm only going to have two arguments, x and l. So this, this only, what I'm going to show you, we normally only do if we have predicates, if we have the equivalent of a scheme function that has a question mark that always returns true or false, because there are only two values that can be returned. Because there are only two values that can be returned, we can encode those as success and failure. Success represents true, failure represents false. And we can see there's some trade-offs. Whether or not one is better than the other, I think it depends on the context. Oleg seems to prefer this way of doing it. Uh, I Sometimes I prefer this way, uh, and it does have some advantages over the other way we've done it. Otherwise, you know, just just depends on what I want to do. Okay, so here, do you see in the first clause where we return false? Well, if we write the code this way, 
anytime you would re return false in the scheme version, you would just fail. We're just going to fail. So in this case, if L is the empty list, then we fail. And what is failure? Well, you know, we could either define something called fail, or we could just do something like unify five and six. Okay, so we could define fail. Maybe something like that, something that always fails. So there are various ways to do it. And depending on the version of MiniKenren you're using or the implementation you're using, you may or not have may or not may or may not have something called fail or the equivalent. But you can always do that. In, in the books, we call it hash u for failure. Um, so we could just fail or call fail uh, or have fail here, I should, should say. But the other thing is, well, if we're always going to fail, we actually don't need it at all. We can just get rid of that clause entirely. So we can just pretend that this didn't exist. So if you want to think of it this way, if our farm member row is only going to succeed if x is in the empty list, then if, if the if L or sorry if x is in L, if if we only succeed if x is in L, then if L is the empty list, there's no way for us to succeed. So we're going to fail. So there's no no reason to even handle that case. So we we'll just ignore that clause. So so it simplifies our code. That's one way one reason you might prefer this way of, of writing member row. Okay, so let's look at the next case. So that case we return hash t. So we're going to have to actually implement this case. So in this case. We want to know, OK, is, is the first thing in L equal to x? OK, fine. And we know how to play this game. OK, and if that's the case, we just succeed. We don't do anything else. We don't return you know, metaphorically. We don't associate with with a third argument, like an out argument or an x and l argument. Before we had an x and l argument that got unified with uh, hash, hash t in this case, but we're not doing that. Here we just succeed. Success represents uh, truth, basically, or, or uh, hash t. So, you know. And then the else case, you know, we also have the same sort of fresh ad and taking a card and a critter. And now we're saying that x is not equal to a, and now we recur. So that's what our member row would look like. And so now we're representing success. Success is basically hash t, and failure is hash f, if you want to think of it this way. So let's try this version of member row and see how that works. We no longer have an out argument. So does Y occur in ABC? No, it doesn't, and it just failed. Does A occur in ABC? Yes, it does. And L, or, or query variable Q, I'll call it Q, uh, could be anything. Okay. And does A occur in A, A, B, C? Yeah, it succeeds, but only succeeds once. You know, we got one success, and that's it. We're done. Okay, so so here we are not getting back hash t and hash f, or, or hash t and hash f are not you know associated with the third argument of the call. Um, here we're just succeeding or, fa or failing, and sometimes that's all you need because maybe you're you're making this call to member o as like a guard within an interpreter you're writing as a relation or something like that, and you only care about success or failure, you don't actually care about hash t or hash f. But notice we have lost some, some flexibility, because before we were able to run these queries where we would do things like, say, you know, uh, give me the lists, give me lists for which y is not an element of the list. You know, we've lost the ability to express that sort of computation. But our code is shorter. And we didn't have to play around with the third argument. This might be more efficient in some cases. Uh, the other thing is we often can can simplify this code to make it much more uh, efficient, or much, sorry, much simpler. So there, there are a few optimizations we can do here. So for example, um, notice in each each of the clauses we're doing a fresh AD. We have to we're using AD as new logic variables, right? 
Uh, and, and in each case, we're taking the cons of AD and unifying that with L. Well, we can simplify the code by lifting a fresh AD up top, outside of the condi. And furthermore, the cons AD to L, the unification, happens in both cases. So we can lift that out as well. So that's equivalent to this code. So we lifted the fresh and the unification out. This fresh nil, fresh no arguments, that's not necessary. That can just be replaced with the single unification. Uh, same down here. Because a con B clause has implicitly a fresh nil in it. So that's the code we end up with, which is much shorter and easier to read, I think, than the other code. So, you know. So that's a nice, short, simple definition of member row. Uh, that's nice, nice, easy to read, is quite efficient, all those sorts of good properties. Okay. Uh, so that's that's the decision you have to make when you're right when you're translating a predicate, something that only returns true or false from many canron from scheme into many canron. Do you want to have an explicit third argument that represents sort of the the output or whether that X occurs within L, or do you just want to succeed or fail and have that representing either hash T or hash F? And that's up to you. That's that's a decision you get to make. Um, in the book, we always do it this way. We always have, have this version that either just succeeds or fails. And it really depends on what you want to do, which version is more appropriate. Uh, I usually will write predicates this way. And then sometimes it'll turn out that uh, I want a little more expressive control, and I'll add the third argument. But this is only for predicates. This is only for things that only only return hash t and hash f. If you return values other than hash t or hash f, you're going to want to have something that's metaphorically equivalent to the output argument, just like with, we did with the other version of Membro, like this. Okay. So that that shortcut I showed you is really just for predicates. OK, so that's member and member row and why you want this quality constraints, a little bit about that, uh, and the fact that you can write a, um, a predicate in different ways, depending on whether or not you want the, uh, you know, want the extra expressive power or whether you would prefer to model success as, you know, truth as success, false as failure, and have a simpler definition. Up to you. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So I, I feel like uh, this is a lot. And before I get into the next definition, I think maybe this is a good place to take a break. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get, you know, because the next thing we do is going to be um, a non-predicate. You know, so, so I, I sort of went over a pen quickly an appendo, but I didn't get into sort of all the details. We've seen a lot of it. We've seen about how, how you have, have to be very careful with the guards or the tests in the con when you're translating this into a con D, right? So that, that we've definitely understood. But there's some other aspects that we haven't really gotten into all the details of. And so for the next thing we do, which will be a non-predicate, we'll get into some more of those details and what we call unnesting the recursions and stuff like that. We'll get into a little bit about why you have to do that. Um, but I think maybe we should save that for next time, uh, just so because there's so many things we saw today that I don't want to overload people. Or do do you want to go? Okay, you're always in favor of breaks. Okay, well let's let's take a break, and we can just hang out. If anyone wants to ask questions about the stuff we've we've shown today, that's fine. Uh, but I, I do think this is plenty. I mean, this is. I'm trying to think of the chapters of the book, how many chapters we've gone through. Um, you know, I think we've gone through Yeah, we've basically gone through chapter three of the book now. Yeah, we've gone through like the first three chapters of the book of Mini Cameron. Um, and this is not, you know, this isn't simple stuff. So if you find it 
tricky, don't be surprised, and you have to think about it and play around with it a bit. And of course, you know, you, you're not really going to get to know this until you or define your own definition. So one thing you could try is defining your own predicates. Okay, so we did we did member, um, but try doing some other list based thing that doesn't involve numbers or arithmetic. Let's not mess around with that yet. But but something involving number. Oh, sorry, lists. You know, so uh, you know, so we did basically the something contain something else. But you could do uh, you know what, what's another good predicate over lists. Um, Well, you could, I mean, if you want to do something a little more advanced, you could take a list and ask whether or not all the elements of that first list appear in the second list. Okay, so that's a little, that's a more complicated version of what we wrote. Instead of just taking some value like a symbol and asking if the symbol occurs in the list, you could take a list and ask, does every element of this list appear within the other list? Now you're doing basically set operations. This is like a subset operation. Okay, so you could do something like that. So is the first is the first list a subset of the second list, that kind of thing. Okay, so that'd be an example of, of something you could try in Minicamera and that would be a little more a little more sophisticated. Um, but still still be a predicate. And you could try it both ways. You could try it with the hash T hash F explicit version, or you could try it with just a succeed and fail version if you want to try that. Also, if you have the book and you're following along, you know, you can just do the exercises in the book or go go through the ones in the book. And hopefully this will give you a little more insight as, as to what's happening. OK, well, why don't we take a break there? Because I think I need a break, too. <laughs> I need a break. And I need some food. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure, thanks. And uh, you know, this is still kind of, this is a weird world that you're in if you haven't seen this stuff before. Uh, but but you know where we're going, right? We're going to the point where we're going to be able to write interpreters in the same style. And I think you can already start seeing maybe how some of that would work. Okay, so the condi is going to be like the pattern match, like the p match across the expressions, right? We're going to do something like that. We're going to be able to get back multiple answers back now. Um, you know, so so. Everything we're doing right now is preparing us to write the relational interpreter. And uh, maybe the next Hangout we'll be able to start at least writing some of the helpers, like the lookup -o. You know, lookup -o is not really that much more complicated than what we just wrote for member -o. member -o and lookup -o are actually almost exactly the same, except member -o doesn't, oh, sorry, lookup -o, uh, isn't a predicate. It returns a value always. And, and, you know, so lookup returns a value. Lookup O is going to associate its third argument uh, with a value. But lookup O and, and member O are actually very similar structurally, except one works on association less. Um, so we're, we're close to the part where we can write things like lookup O. And once we have that, then we should be able to write the interpreter. So you know, we're, we're not far from being able to write the interpreter. I'm just trying to, to bang on the mini camera and stuff a little bit so that it's it's not too mysterious when we get to the relational interpreter. But you know, in practice, you'll probably have to play around with Mini Cameron for a while to really get a good sense of it if you haven't seen this style of programming. For sure. Took me a while to wrap my head around it. Whereas for functional programming, at least for Lisp, you know, when, once I really saw Lisp, I was I was ready for Lisp. I was like, oh, I've been programming for all these years, but this seems so natural to me. Whereas with logic programming, it did not seem natural to me. It's like, oh, what in the world's going on? So now it seems natural to me, but it took a while. Uh, okay, well, let's, let's take a break here, and we'll pick up next weekend. And uh, um, if anyone wants to stay around and ask questions, uh, feel free to do so. See you all next time. Bye.